Welcome to Oleg Show. You're watching ALM TV. On today's episode. So I had to package an hour of content within like five days with 30 plus talent from all around the US. And I'm directing through Zoom and we're editing all in the office. We had four editors. We're just like working around the clock. Insane. And I didn't sleep for four days. On today's show, I'm privileged to have a really special guest, a film director, editor, DP, musician, and award-winning content creator based in Hollywood, LA, Ben Haggerty. With communications degree from the University of Northern Iowa, he started his journey as a freelance content creator and worked his way to collaborating alongside 21st century show business icons Beyonce, Jay-Z, Chris Brown, Justin Bieber, Snoop Dogg, Dwayne Johnson The Rock, Schoolboy Q, Kendrick Lamar, g Easy, Mac Miller and others. He's directed, produced or co-edited numerous documentaries and TV series including Welcome to My Life for Chris Brown, Strength of a Woman for Mary J. Blige, Chasing Greatness for Lewis Hose, directed and produced promotional content for EA Games for franchises like Madden, NBA Live, The Sims, Need for Speed and more. He has collaborated with brands like Adidas, Disney and many others. He is a founder of Black With No Cream, production company and a co-host of an all-time best podcast for creatives under the same brand name. His work was recognized with numerous awards from Best Breakthrough Long-Form Video at VMAs for Chris Brown Royalty Series up to Grammy and Best Music Film or Homecoming Film by Beyonce. God damn. <laughs> with that being said, Ben, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you. Yo, that's the best intro that I've ever heard from myself, ever. Uh, amazing. Congrats, that's great, great work, good good reporting, goddamn. I, I felt bad because you were like taking breaths, I'm like, damn, I really did all that? <laughs> yeah, but it's incredible. Like, you know, looking uh, back at, at almost, I guess, 10 years of your career, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was like a, a ton of things that you can be really proud of, like, you know, red carpets and uh, great collaborations, uh, working with uh, these icons of the 21st century, these idols. Uh, it's like something that we can kind of see from outside and appreciate, but something that most of people probably won't be able to see is the behind the scenes, right? It's the countless hours that you put into work on uh, like empowering yourself and learning your skills, like grinding, staying hungry, and uh, at the same time, be, being humble and focused on your goal, uh, make sure that you deliver on your promises and, you know, also being, uh, bringing as most value as possible to, to your clients. This is something that is like kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and so my first question is, how do you balance those, those two sides of yourself? Yeah, I mean, it, it is true. It's like you're constantly chasing uh, greatness, which is ironic because that's the name of the documentary for the Lewis House project we did. But like you're chasing your greatness and you have goals in your mind that you want to accomplish. And and, um, and that does take a lot of work that most people will never know. Uh, I think anything that we watch or pay attention to will never understand how much work goes into something. I was just last night watching, I don't know if you're familiar with Gibson Hazard. He's a director and he just I directed heard. a music mu yeah he's he's directed a bunch of stuff and he just directed a big music video for Lil Nas X and the video is outstanding and you watch it it's maybe two and a half minutes but the the 4D elements and the the whole it's completely VFX probably took months of work and late nights and and no one ever gets to know that you watch it for two minutes and then you move on with your life you watch a documentary for an hour and a half you have no idea someone sat in a room for like a year piecing it all together you know and uh yeah, it's uh, finding the balance and being able to like kind of stay humble, I guess, is easy because I just I've learned to respect other creators. That's why I started my thing, Black Window Cream, and try to like talk to other creatives. And I understand the process. And I think that is some of the coolest things. And that's what I looked up to getting started was just other creatives and tried. I wanted to learn what the behind the scenes was like, because I know it looks cool on screen, but how the hell did that get made? made you know, so. Um, I paid really close attention to that. And uh, I just try to find, I, I don't know, I try to find a way to share those behind the scenes moments, because I think that's the best education. You know what I'm saying? That's true. That's true. Uh, rolling back uh, this year, like uh, looking back, uh, January 26, right? The original Netflix documentary, Homecoming, a film by Beyonce, shot at Coachella Festival, won Grammy and the best music film. I guess you were part of the crew, right? You were director of photography on that project. Um, 
I was a Movi operator. I, I um, did a lot of behind the scenes documenting and I ran a Movi uh, for the Steadicam shots, like all the performance stuff. Right, right. So upon the release of just the trailer of the film, it was watched, I believe, 16.6 million times across all the Netflix social media accounts, as well as Beyonce's Facebook page, just within first 24 hours. According to Netflix, it was the fourth most popular documentary um, in 2019 on the platform. Many publications, including uh, the Washington Post and The Guardian, named Homecoming a one of the greatest concert films of all time. Damn. What was your experience like working on it? How did it come about? And uh, what were the challenges and what you've learned about yourself working on this uh, project? I didn't know most of the stats, but that's really cool. Uh, I mean, my experience, you know, getting in, involved, I got looped in through a friend, uh, a friend of a friend, basically recommended me and um and kind of i was try you know i went to a tryout and i got to shoot with uh during a rehearsal day and kind of show them what i was capable of doing and they liked it so they started inviting me back and and things got into motion and i didn't know it was for coachella right away um but once i found that out i realized how much preparation was going to go into this and and i wanted to be on my a game so i just tried to deliver every single day and make sure i could stay you know it's kind of like Uh, in America, you have like football, which is so funny that I'm tying this analogy to it because I don't I'm the worst like sports fan ever and don't know shit about football. But I know that you make a cut, right? And you want to be on the, the the starting team. And if you don't, you can get cut and then eventually you're just off the team and you lose your money and you lose your opportunity to become a pro football player. It's the same thing with that. Like I came and I really wanted to make sure I could stay a part of the team. And I just worked so hard and I tried my best and um and her team was really receptive and they're awesome to work with. And they kept me on and uh, the role from kind of documenting the process switched to uh, me starting to do like the steady cam work um, using, I had a Ronin, uh, I had the Ronin S, no, what was I using? The M, I had the Ronin M and, um, and I was just testing some shots and they liked it. And that turned into me kind of swapping out with the steady cam operator. They, they didn't have him there yet. And so I started shooting that stuff and, and it was just really cool to have, You know, I just believed in something and I tried it and people saw it and accepted it and it turned into something way bigger. The next thing you know, uh, months later, I'm starting the show off with me and Beyonce and I'm I'm walking to her through all these dancers and I, I reveal her for the first time for the show and then walk backwards and lead her to the stage. And that clip got shared so much. It was like unreal to me within that first day. People were going nuts and uh, it, it was really cool to be a part of it. It was awesome that... Uh, I know I'm skimming over it, but it's it's just like such a surreal job opportunity, you know? I mean, like three years before that, I was living on a air mattress, you know? So it, it's kind of crazy to see how that shit just catapults real quick as long as you put in the work. Exactly. I can imagine. What was like the, the biggest insight you got from that experience for yourself personally? <sighs> biggest insight, I would say, is um, I think it's really knowing that you can push yourself. I think that I saw not only Beyonce, but I saw 100 dancers, 100 band members. Like a, we had a really large performance uh, with people from all over the world coming together to make this thing happen. And every single person from production to the staff at her company to be herself really pushed themselves. And I, I wasn't going to go half-ass like that. I, I went as hard as I possibly could. I mean, I'm holding this really heavy camera all day long you know sometimes we'd have long days and you're, you're auditioning shots and stuff and it can really like be strenuous on your body and i pushed through it like i did whatever it took to make sure i delivered and i think that that taught me that uh my capabilities go beyond what you think you, i just had a project not too long ago for the nfl and ea sports for madden and it was like the quickest turnaround to deliver an hour-long tv series or a, a, a pre-show game for the nfl And so I had to package an hour of content within like five days with 30 plus talent from all around the US. And I'm doing directing through Zoom and we're editing all in the office. We had four editors. We're just like working around the clock. Insane. And I didn't sleep for four days. Insane. So being from coming from Coachella and working so hard, it's like it builds up that muscle to be able to take on challenges that sometimes seem impossible. But I, I literally didn't sleep for four days. And there's something about how you can unlock that in your body to make sure you just do whatever it takes to get the job done. Right. Um, I think that's something that you can notice in creatives and that turns me on to creators because I can tell that there's other people out there that are like me that, that would push themselves that hard. And, 
but it takes, it takes some learning lessons. And I think like that Coachella and every job before that, every time it made me better and last longer and try harder and, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Talking about building those muscles, right? Those professional muscles. Uh, how do you think, what were the, like the cornerstones of your uh, path uh, from, uh, let's say from the, from the beginning, from when you were started as a freelancer, right back home, all the way to doing Coachella and this NFL things? Like, what do you think are the kind of cornerstone moments that kind of uh, changed or helped you to build up you as a creative the way you are right today? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, for me, I mean, going back to from the middle of the, I'm from Iowa, which is maybe five hours from Chicago. It's a corn state surrounded by corn, small college town. Uh, growing up there, I was heavily involved in music. And like yourself, like you, you were in a band and did the rock thing. I did the same thing too and turned into like rap music eventually. And we were, I was just obsessed with writing and making music. And I think having created that like relationship with other musicians and creatives early, like I found my people, you know what I mean? From going to shows and going to punk shows and basements and traveling around in vans early on to, to then going on to touring and massive tour buses with 300 crew, 400 crew members. Right. Like I went from the smallest version of it to the biggest version of it, which is surreal. And so having done that early, I was able to adjust and understand what I was doing and what I wanted to do and how I could bond with people. And I think the building relationships piece was the biggest uh, impact that I got in every, every step of the way, because being able to learn how to, uh, rely on people and how to trust people and how to create co-create with people and collaborate like being able to learn that early on helped me as I continue to make new friends when I moved to Los Angeles and I was able to get into a room and suggest myself and find ways to insert myself into other people's projects without overstepping my bounds you know what I mean like right. I, I think that just being around like-minded people and finding people that you can trust and and lean into is one of the most prominent things but uh and it turns into networking. Like, I think that that's always it. But I think that if you're talking about literal moments, uh, like literal moments in my life, I think having done the music part of it, it went to like, you know, being in the basement to recording music, to playing shows personally in front of like thousands of people. Right. And then to give that up and move to LA and I chased LA, I left. Uh, I was waiting for all my friends to move with me. And that was the hardest part because everyone else had an agenda and, and, they couldn't leave. So I had to eventually just go on my own. And I, I moved um, to LA by myself and stayed at a friend's house and I slept on the floor and uh, I did whatever it took. It's the same thing as what I was talking about earlier. I pushed myself, like, how long can I live on a floor? How long can I uh, live out of a suitcase and share a room with three people and right. not sleep? And, you know, um, and I think just making that adjustment was one of the most like trusting myself that I would be able to do it. Also having a backup plan. It wasn't entirely insane. Like I could always go back to my right. home, you know, right. and right. Uh, re recreate a path. But yeah, I think taking that risk was really key. Exactly. And it's also like kind of uh, taking on that responsibility, right? That comes along with it, with those opportunities. Talking about networking, yeah. I think in some of the um, uh, interviews, you mentioned that you were discovered at South by Southwest. Can you elaborate a bit more on that uh, particular episode? What was it? Uh, what project was it? And how you got discovered? Yeah. Um, so I had met through a friend, um, a dude in LA named Craig, right? And so Craig had a cool house in LA and it was basically like a creative incubator. Like he would try to get other creatives to come together. People would stay at the house. They lived there. Some didn't live there. There's always people that we always had music being made there and, um, and cool projects were just coming from it. And so I had met him once and was in Iowa and he knew what I was doing and he was going to South by Southwest and renting a house and trying to bring creatives together there. And so he's like, yo, I want to fly you down here and um, have you just kind of shoot for some of the artists that I'm going to be with. And, um, and then just also network for yourself and try to connect dots and do whatever. And, and I was still doing music at the time. So he was trying to help me there. He's like, you never know who we're going to be around. Like right. maybe you can talk about your music and stuff. So right. I was like, all right, cool. So I flew down there. Um, and I, we were, we were, we weren't really doing anything. There was not really anything to shoot. Like we kind of went to a couple of shows, but he didn't really have the open doors that we needed right away until we got a message from Musa. And so Musa is the son of Top. 
Top owns Top Dog Entertainment. Top Dog Entertainment right. is the label of Kendrick Lamar, says uh, Schoolboy yes. Q, et cetera. Yes. So Musa hits Craig and says, yo, you got your video guy there. I have a new artist I'm working with. Have him go film that person. So I went and it's, uh, his name's Kembe. He was on my podcast, Kembe X. And he played a show. I never met him before. I never heard his music. We get to this event. It's probably one of the bigger shows that happen at South by Southwest. Right. And uh, right away they tell me I can't go on the stage with him. He only has three songs to perform. Um, you can shoot in this one spot in the pit. That's it. And I was like, damn. So as soon as I called his name, I just ran up with him like I was an artist and started <laughs> shooting. And I shot where I needed to be, which is like slightly inappropriate now when I look at it as far as professionalism. But I knew I needed more dynamic shots besides just one angle in the pit right. uh, to try to impress this person. And so I went shot, 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 shot. We left. The artist was like, yo, that's cool. Like, I don't know what you just did, but like, I feel like you got it. And I was like, all right, cool. And I went home and I just started editing, flipped a 30 second little Instagram video and uh, sent it to Craig. Craig sent it to Musa. And then the next day I was editing another video and they came in and they're like, yo, Musa, you know, Musa, um, he just hit me. He said that he loves your work. He loves how fast you were at turning around the cut. Like he, he really messes with you. He wants to take you on the TDE world tour. And I was like, what the fuck? And so Having done that one job uh, turned into him, this person being able to say, like, I'm going to put you on tour with Kendrick, Q, J-Rock, Absol, all these artists. Because um, we had, the, you know, they had like a tour coming up, but they right. ended up canceling that tour. Right. But it was my first first opportunity. Like, I shot for an artist I wasn't familiar with right. because we knew that it was a, a connection and just tried. I tried my hardest. And he ended up seeing it and later on became the person who put me on Schoolboy Q's tour, which was my first world tour that I did, which is a Grammy nominated artist and a super fucking huge rapper here. And that's when I came to Finland was with Schoolboy Q. And um, I got to see the world with that dude. And it's all because Musa saw that one 30 second video from Texas that I got flown down, not paid to go there. Uh, just went. I just went and tried my hardest. Crazy. It's crazy. Crazy. Crazy story. It's something you mentioned earlier that it's like, even if you're given like a very small opportunity, treat it as the best thing that could have happened to you, right? Like just uh, yeah. put put all 100% of your effort and make sure that you kill that opportunity. And though like you don't have like a short term economical reward for that work or whatever, but just bringing your, your craft out there and, and putting your name out there and just doing your best is always going to you know pay out eventually. Hands down. That's what I tell people that every single day, like you never know what's going to come from something. Like I didn't know any of that was going to happen. We just knew that it was a TDE affiliate. So I'm like, Oh my God, like that's so cool to be just shooting this artist that no one knows yet. Right. Uh, that turned into like being able to shoot one of their biggest artists on their label. So true. And it did, it turned into Kendrick. I shot all of them. I've shot all of them and I'm good friends with TDE still to this day. And like, uh, it's crazy how that just jumping on these opportunities and just kind of like, You know, it's a, it's a constant debate. I think there's always a debate in the creative industry of like, when should you work for free or when should you, you know, fight for money and uh, do internships for free and have mentors and all this shit. And everything is different. Everyone's story is different. But I think that from interviewing hundreds of creatives, like on my story, it's like the most common denominator is that people will do whatever it takes. They've done whatever it takes. The most successful people I've been able to talk to have done something that they didn't know was going to turn into had no monetary value. It had no tr promise that there was going to be a, a light at the end of the tunnel. They just did it. They may have done 10 of those, 20 right. of those, a hundred right. of those. You know what I mean? Like we, I, I don't know how many things I've done that I'm like, I'll never share or even remember that I did it. But right. I was just like, man, you never know what could come from this. And so you go and try it and then maybe some shit comes and maybe some shit don't come. Exactly. Uh, but it's about, it's about being willing to like give your all and, and really, you know, go for it. Exactly. I think also like being a creative and like being a person who uh, like shadows the artist or like, you know, collects this imagery from the tours or from the shows. I think that person is also a psychologist in a way, because you really need to know the person, you need to know how to show them, how to present them, and you need mm -hmm. to know what the audience wants to see, right? So um, I understand it in the way that you really have to understand very well this human psyche of, of, of the people you're working with. And uh, I'm just curious, like from your experience working with, you know, this uh, big artists like Beyonce, Jay-Z, uh, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, uh, what were the observations on your behalf from them? Like what are the traits of character uh, you can kind of dissect or crystallize based on your experience communicating with them? What like stands out to you? 
That's funny that you say that because I, I 100% I, I agree with that. And I remember the only class I really ever connected with was psychology and being able to understand how to, and sociology, like understand how people work and how they think. And right. uh, I'm always so curious about that. And especially when you get into the world of superstars, like when you get around talented, award-winning artists or celebrities, it's so interesting because that's not, we're not that you know what I mean? Right. Like that's right. not, we're, we're not that. I don't know what the fuck that's like to be like that. And exactly. so to be, to be able to get into spaces with these people and help tell their stories in that moment, you know what I mean? Is one of my favorite things. And I think, I think what I've learned from being around, I mean, first everyone's, they're all normal people. You know what I mean? Like, I think that no matter how famous you are or how much money you have and so on, you're just, a, you're another person. You just have a layer to you that most people don't. And it's a weird shield that kind of separates you. And I think the one thing I learned early on, I think this would go back to like working around maybe Chris Brown early on was treating him just normal, like a normal dude, because I saw a lot of people treat him like a superstar, which is fair. And he deserves to be treated like a superstar. But when you have everyone tell you yes to everything and everyone's running at your your fingertips and just making sure you always have what you need and right. you, you know you're just the king of the castle and you have no allies and i think that there's something about uh treating people normally and having real discussions and and open yourself up to to doing your job but also being just a person trying to connect and i think that's what i learned early on is if i treat you as normal as i possibly can like i would treat my brother Right. or my sister or my, you know, my friends, then it shouldn't be hard for us to connect. You know what I mean? I right. feel like I make right. friends with a lot of people. It's, it's pretty easy. So right. why would right. I not be able to do it with you? Right. Um, and, and that transcended, I went to, to being on tour with Q, um, getting on that tour. There was, I was in a tour bus with fucking 11 dudes. A lot of them are Crips uh, from fucking the hood in LA and shit. I've never really been around a lot of Crips. So how do I fucking adapt to that shit? And I just was me. And, and then all of a sudden fucking I'm good in the hood. Like I can go to the hood and like, <laughs> and shit like that. You know what I mean? But like to become friends and then right, to make right. you feel very exactly. uh, safe and shit. Like to, for, if you can mm. feel safe and trusted, like, you know, that my job is to make you a look amazing and right. be who you are and B you can trust me that this, there's nothing I'm trying to do. I'm not seeking out to like, ruin your life or or take some footage of a moment in your life and leak that shit or something uh i think that that's it it's just building this trust and i've learned I, it goes a long way with every artist i've worked with and every celebrity i've been able to work with it's, it's wild even brands too it's the same thing yeah it's insane actually like uh, getting ready to this interview i watched all the five episodes of uh the schoolboy q uh tour that you've, oh, wow. done, you've done i think it, it was really incredible amazing and like it Thank you. I, I think you were also mentioning that though it like seems on the outside again that it's like all the party thing and like having fun and you know like just having the best time of your lives but at the same yeah. time you were working 24 7 and 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 being focused like exactly to make sure you deliver the best work of art which you did and uh, yeah. i just strongly recommend everybody to um, go watch those those episodes it's called the blank face tour uh with schoolboy q yeah there's so you know it's funny i just watched so there's five episodes on youtube right right and there's seven total okay. there's a sixth one that's done and then there's a seventh one that's like been started and hasn't been finished because i knew that the sixth one wasn't coming out so i was like well why should i waste my time finishing this shit and i was just showing someone the sixth episode last night like literally 12 hours ago wow and it's funny that you said that just because i fucking love that series and like that is a a, a good reflection for me to to think about the come up you know what i mean like that's one of the most pinnacle moments in my life is that tour because like you said i wasn't every night those dudes had liquor weed right. they could get chicks if they wanted to they right. could go do all any, go to any club do whatever right. and i was just filming all of it and then i'm editing in the midst of all this shit yeah. and yeah. i just constantly try my hardest to like create that content which i think that series is amazing exactly. and i do have a plan to one day release the final two episodes which it we're in finland we go to we go all throughout europe there's all kinds of shit that's missing and so yeah. uh i want to conclude that story but I mean, yeah, it is, it is really about that. And it wasn't hard, but it was, there was nights where you're trying to like edit in the tour bus and you're dumping footage and there's like girls walking around their asses are like hitting your card and it's fucking pulling out of the computer and you have to redump the media and shit. I was just like, insane, Jesus insane, Christ. Insane. Yeah. It was like, intense. Sounds more like a battlefield that you were kind of training, training yourself to. Yeah, it was. 
Shit. If you can do a Q tour, you could do anything. <laughs> exactly. Actually, not Q's tour. It was very light. Like I think that there's probably many other tours, like artists that that are probably just un unreal uh, nuts and would be very challenging mm. to work with. Even Q himself told me like the tours previous to him to the Blank Face tour, where he's like, "Man, this we used to get nuts. Like it was just drugs and fucking turning up and all this shit all the time. Like you would have fucking right. hated it." <laughs> right, like, right, insane. All right, all right. yeah. If if you were to start over from zero today, um, having uh, no connection to the industry and not knowing anybody, what would you do? Like, what would you recommend to somebody who is just starting out? Is it like about cold calling, emailing? Uh, like, what do you think are the recipe for 2020 starting the creative career? Uh, I think, I mean, straight up, the number one recipe is black window cream. Okay. I swear <laughs> to God, I did... I, I think it's funny because a lot of people that create something like this, they're always like, I wish I had this when I was getting started, but I lit, I literally would have killed for this resource. I think having a community of creators, but also a podcast where we're doing similar things like you talking to people, trying to yeah. crack the code, feel it, right. fill it out. How do they get there? Right. Every story is different. You, you, I hate that you didn't record the part where you told me about your story because my, whoever's coming from me should hear that shit. Cause that's a fucking crazy story. You got to start a band, the guy, passed away from leukemia and shit and 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 you figured out a way to stay in touch with music and the thing you love that's amazing so i think yeah. through talking to creatives and and being able to find that as a resource and just go through every i mean there's kids that hit me and like yo i just found black window cream i'm listening to every episode from the beginning to the end i'm like god damn that's like that's like out hundreds of hours of exactly. audio like you're exactly gonna, but i fucking fuck with kids like that because that means that you see the benefit of this source and that you can go sit through it and you can hear the stories from top photographers, top videographers, right. top musicians, top producers, to anything that I talk, everyone I talk to, but like everyone's story, although it might not uh, fit with what you do, if you want right. to be a filmmaker, but you think a photographer might not have any, any value to talk to you, but they're talking about lighting all day long. And that lighting is a fucking, that's very key for what you would do as a filmmaker. Like right. you're going to find benefits in these stories. So I, I, I really do think, uh, being able to tap into resources and understand the value of resources, communities, finding, uh, there's a lot of cool people that are teaching. Like people, people do take the time to teach. And I, I wish I had all of that when I was getting started. I honestly do. And the internet is a powerful thing right now, but, I, and the other thing I would suggest is mentorship. Like I know it's hard to find a mentor. It's fine, hard to get someone. I think people immediately think I need a mentor and they look at a famous person and like, that will be my mentor. Right. But my mentor was my homie, Chuck who we both lived in base in the house and we made music all day long. And he just had a couple of years in the game more than I did and right. had been through some shit, but we both liked things and I was able to collaborate with him, but also learn from him. And although we were just friends, he was my mentor, I don't, whether he liked it or not. Like, and I learned so much. And so, um, you know, I think that that's incredibly important is to try to find people that you can, can learn from right. in every angle that you want to, you know, grow in. Right. How do you feel about personal branding in this uh, realm? And uh, if you would describe Ben Haggerty brand, how would you describe it? Like what components <laughs> it consists of? I think I have the worst brand for myself because I don't know. I, I'm like very good at telling you what you should do for your shit. And that's probably why I work with a lot of artists and a lot of uh, brands. But when it comes to me personally branding Ben, Uh, my website, I deleted after Beyonce's tour, I think just because I was like, I need to update this. Never did. It's just, I have no website anymore. There's nowhere mm -hmm. to see my, my body of work. But the number one thing I tell everyone on the podcast is like, make a website, have a portfolio. I tell you all day long, but I'm right. like, it doesn't really matter to me because I like am pretty busy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my, my brand is very bad, but I think what, when it comes to personal branding, I think that, um, You know, it's funny, my partner, Dave in Black Widow Cream, he right. first was my intern, the first intern I ever had for Black Widow Cream, and then became uh, my homie. And we went and toured. He, I got him on the Beyonce job and he did Coachella with me, toured the world right, with me. Right, right. It's super ill. Um, the reason, something that stuck out to me when going through all the intern applications, when I went to his website, he had a logo. It was just a logo that said David Malave, and it had these headphones with like electricity around them. He shot music. He, he was a, a music videographer. And I thought that that shit was so clever and just such a neat, neatly packaged, well thought out idea. It was super small accent. And he was, he was just getting started. It's not like the content was amazing yet, right, right. but, but the idea was there. And I was like, wow, that shit, 
just caught my attention amongst however many other people applied. That's what stuck out to me. And I gravitated towards that. I think that by caring about, you know, your stamp and the way that you kind mm-hmm. of set your tone, my, I think my branding has been in my work. I think that right. people can watch some of my stuff and kind of right. be like, that's a Ben video um, or that's a Ben photo. And, and, or, uh, and so I think I always try to lean into that in comedy and that's always been part of my stamp, but I think honing in on what it is that you do that people can connect with and, and, kind of ingrained in their brain so when they see you again i haven't changed my avatar right. on social media right. since like since it like 2013 i think i don't know why i just have always had this one picture um and i think people will see that and they'll recognize it as me and then someday i'll probably change it and i'll try to like revamp my whole thing but um i do think that there's like multiple different ways and i feel like i'm doing a terrible job answering this question right now <laughs> <laughs> But it's actually, it's funny because I think it's often what happens to somebody who is serving others. It's like you are so focused on, uh, you know, everybody else that sometimes you forget about your own self. But as you said, like your brand is your work. Like whoever mm-hmm. is watching your stuff uh, knows and can connect the dots, you know, and, and know yeah. who's behind the work. Absolutely. No, yeah, I agree. And I think that um, although my branding for myself is just like obsolete, just like doesn't exist. Um, I've put my energy, I think if I didn't have black window cream, I would have put my energy into branding myself, but I'm constantly focused on branding others and black window cream and building the identity for the community and that brand. Uh, and I, and I'm proud of that. I think that we've come a long way in branding black window cream and, and making that, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, but yes. I think that, uh, that's where my energy has been focused on. And, and yeah, it is, it is hard to really think about that when you're so focused, you can, spend all your energy focusing on making someone else's brand perfect. Yeah. And when, when you get the time to think about yourself, it's like the last thing you want to do. I'm like, man, I just want to go surf right. or, or fucking right. sleep or something. You know what I mean? Right. Right. But I think you, you succeeded in kind of establishing black with no cream with a very solid image of, you know, this well of wisdom and the great knowledge coming from the industry experts, because like, for example, for myself, when I first discovered, I, I think I was watching some, Uh, videos about like uh, charging clients or like how how to charge a client you know like getting yep. th- those kind of basic things yeah, and yeah. I-, i came across the video on your channel and i started watching and i just i was blown away by the level of detail and uh, the level of you know kind of understanding of how things work and this coming from somebody who has actually done the work in the industry who is a practitioner right that was like eye-opening thing and then i, st- I just got hooked up and i started lo- uh, looking more more and more episodes and uh it's just incredible like the work that you are doing the the the, the guests that you're having the quality is just top notch so uh, thank you talking about black with no cream uh what is your personally favorite episode and why shit that's a great question um there's police driving by i live in hollywood so they they oftentimes drive right by my fucking window when i'm doing interviews that's awesome so you get some entertainment uh, right there Yeah, we got some quick entertainment. So there was a high speed chase. I'm not even gonna lie. I saw them fishtail around the corner here. It was like a fucking movie. I thought they were shooting a, a film. I mean, I live in Hollywood, so it, right. and a chopper flew down. It was incredible. Like, it was insane. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, my favorite episode it is very hard. It is hard to um to pin. I mean, there's so many good ones, and I think all of them have different values. Uh, there's different moments. Like, I there's an artist named Kai who is a good friend of mine here and he's this anonymous artist and he's really well known in the street art and, uh, uh, world. And he has the craziest story. I had to hide his face in the video element of it. Um, and to hear his story, to want to be a true artist and find his own art and have so many naysayers like try mm-hmm. to stop him. He went to one of the best art schools in France and the art teachers are literally like, you're not going to make it. Like, this is not the classes that you need to be in. Like, you're not going to make it. And right. he did whatever it, whatever it took and, and to hear his his success and he's so talented um you know i think that's a great story but also like there's different moments like um i interviewed my friend chris parsons who is kendrick lamar he came up with kendrick uh and i met him through working with q and shit and us shooting kendrick together he came up with kendrick during kendrick's exploding career like from from like kind of people knew kendrick to like everyone knew kendrick and he rode that wave with them and documented so much And he tells, there's part in the interview where he, he breaks down and cries. Um, and he tells the story of hitting absolute rock bottom and having uh, having just like he sent a prayer out 
and thought it was over with and he lost everything. He had nothing left. He, he had enough money to fly back home and be, came home, come home to be a failure. And then he got a phone call and it was Kendrick Lamar and it was, you're coming on tour with me. And it like his, it was insane to hear that moment and to see how, how real it was for him. And I think that the, there's so many stories like that. And so many people really, really care about, um, care about like having left their mark and to hear how important it is for their mark to mean something to someone else to understand that it is possible that we all have been in those situations where shit is trash right. and you can climb out of that trash can, you know, right, um, right. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough to really pinpoint them, but there's a lot of amazing ones. Those are just two that stick out to me right now. There's some really good ones. That one, Damn, that, I wish I would have thought about that. That one was insane. I think I saw that episode uh, for sure. I remember this story and I will, I think we will link up this episode here so people can go watch it right away. Mm. Um, uh, from your experience, uh, like talking to all these creatives, uh, making over 200 episodes on Black With No Cream, um, can you dissect or like kind of crystallize uh, the top three personality qualities or characteristics of the creative that made it in the industry? Like what are the top mm. three characteristics that stood, st stand out for you? Um, I think always the ability to understand how to uh, a network is the most key. Um, being personable and understanding how to be human too. Um, and three, I, well, let me change that. First should be talent. The talent is always, that's number one, right? And then second is the ability to learn how to connect dots and how to build opportunity and be able to tie things together and bring that together. And then third, I think is just being a good person. Like I, I always just like first and foremost, before any of that shit, I always want to just make sure I'm a good person and I'm trying to do right by everybody. And I try to serve everybody and we'll, we'll do this podcast. And right after I'm calling some so mom hit me up and said that her, her like 11 or eight year old kid loves my videos and it's his birthday. So I'm like, cool, let's hop on Zoom. Let me get him amped up, you know? And Amazing. I just always want to help people. And I think that's why I started Black Widow Cream is that. And I think that I see that in a lot of other creatives. And it's like, there's some people out here that just really want it to be about them. They really want it to be about their success and, and they're the shit and that's all that matters. And they don't really do anything above and beyond just being that. And, uh, I try to stay, stay clear of those fucking people. <laughs> right. I've been around too many of them and, and they drag you down. They fuck up your mentality. And, uh, and I, and I've experienced that a lot in the beginning. And, um, and now it's just like, I, I'm like, Oh, you're like that. Cool. I'm out of here. And then you just, it's done. Like I, and I right. don't think about it anymore and it's fucking right. great, but so many people are afraid to, uh, to walk away from those situations. I, I'm sorry. I talk all the time. I'll just talk, 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 talk. So you that, that's why, that's off. why we're here, man. <laughs> all right, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, I know is, I just run it out. This is incredible. Well, I, I think that your, your story is incredible and uh, everything you are doing to giving back to the community is amazing. I want to know, I want to ask you the same question. What do you think from when you talk to different creatives and, and, yeah. and especially being on a different side of the planet for you, yes. what is it that, that sticks out to you about creators that seem to be like, what draws you into a creative? What, what yeah. makes you feel like this is a person I want to be around and work with? Those are like the basic things like work ethics, right? Uh, like when somebody is willing to, to do whatever it takes to deliver on the project and when they are, um, it's like their internal responsibilities, not just because uh, they owe it to the client or they need to do it for the client, but for themselves, you know, to be true to themselves, they have to get it done and uh, just mm. to make work at, to the best of their ability, being enthusiastic about it. Like, you know, when your eyes are sparkling and you can see from the person that he or she is like 100% in the process, I think those are the very attractive features. And of course, as you mentioned, like being, uh, being kind, being uh, polite and being nice. It's like, because it's like the creative world is very sensitive, right? All the artists are very sensitive. Like, um, so you don't want to mess up anything and you are in different situations. I mean, you are also touring, you are going on the shows, you're seeing the crowds and interaction with the, with the fans, with the audience, whatever. Very, it's like a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. And you need to know how to find a balance and how to cater at the same time and serve, right? As, right. as, as a creator. So that's, yeah. that's what I find fascinating. And then how, how uh, you know, for your show and for people who are listening on this, how, if people are listening, then how can they support what you're doing 
with your adventures? Like if they want to get behind your podcast and tune into more shit, like how do you direct them? Cause I know you probably plug it and you're going to be humble and shit, but I think this is a, this is a great interview. You fucking did a really good job. So I'm, I'm like happy as hell about it. it this was fun. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, Kind of in the beginning of my journey with with uh, with interviews, I want to do obviously more of these, but uh, maybe eventually in the future, as you said, I plan to do a website for myself and see if I can accommodate more content. Right now, I'm just uh, filling up the pipes in the, in YouTube and uh, doing other social media stuff like on Instagram and and TikTok. Uh, I kind of, you know, trying to experiment with uh, different mediums and I'm also big on uh, social media content. I love making social media content. And also like when you had that uh, competition for editors for Black with the oh, yeah, Queen, yeah. I was like, yes, I'm going to do it for sure. That was a great experience. So, uh, you know, just whatever kind of uh, works, I, I think I'm going to try and see what comes from, from there. I love it, man. Good. Well, good work. Keep this shit going because you're, you're doing a great job. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think we uh, have more or less information. I know you, you need to run. Uh, it was a huge pleasure to, to have you on. I hope it's uh, our not last uh, uh, meeting and interview and opportunity to communicate. You are an incredible person and I admire you as a creator um, professionally yeah. and, and, and personally. Um, you get to ask the final question of the show for the creatives in Europe. Uh, what would you like to people, uh, for people to answer? So I get to ask anyone in Europe a question. Yes. Okay. Creative, creatives. Artists. Can I ask, creatives. So can I ask all my creatives if they believe that the McDonald's in Europe is better than the McDonald's in America? Because I was told this my first time in Europe, I didn't eat McDonald's. Like I had, I stopped. But then the second time I went to Europe, I had that shit and it was smacking. So do you think that the McDonald's in Europe is better than the McDonald's in America? I want to know. <laughs> uh, and then the second thing is, uh, my question would be like an actual creative question. I think, um, you know, where do you believe you are in your creative journey right now? Then also think, where do you want to go? And then is that step to get to that point too much or too little to you. You know what I mean? And I think if people are answering and saying, ah, oh, it's a lot, then it's okay to explore other options, but also it's not. Like time goes by fucking that quick. Like I think a lot of people will give up on their journey because they think that the, 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 the road to get there is way too long or there's too much or this person has so much more than me already. I, I'll never make it. And if I, if I thought that way, I mean, I should have thought that way millions of times because I'm like, I was terrible when I started. I was fucking bad. And I saw people that had it already. And I, you know, but there's so much opportunity out here that you can find your groove and all it takes is dedication time. And, and so I want you to ask yourself that question and then understand that although it may feel very distant and the success may not come for five years, 10 years, 15 years, it's worth the, it, the work is worth it. And it is absolutely possible. You know what I mean? I think people just assume that's not, but it, it is indeed impossible. So I don't know if that was a good question, but that's a great one. Hopefully that's a great one. Okay, cool. Looking forward to see all the replies in the comment section under this uh, video. Uh, ben, yeah, was a huge pleasure to, to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Hope, uh, wish you all the best for your projects and looking forward to see the new Black with No Cream episodes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. This was great. That's it for today's episode. Thank you for watching and make sure to check out the Black with No Cream podcast for a dose of the industry wisdom. Don't forget to answer Ben's questions in the comment section under this video. If you got any value from this episode, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. I'm Olex for the ALM Studios. Till next time, stay strong and remember to keep it rock and roll.